I'm Lily Jan. I'm a faculty member of the Hotel School here at Cornell, uh, focused on food and beverage management and the moderator of today's session. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to be here today. I'm excited to be here with this exceptional panel of speakers from across the food and beverage industry um, in the United States to discuss the future of F&B. I'm excited to have an honest and open conversation about the struggles that have long plagued the food and um, beverage industry, how to address those issues, and perhaps most importantly, how to not go back to normal, but rather recognize the problems of the past and purposefully and intentionally build a better, more inclusive, um, uh, stronger industry for all. Uh, each of our speakers bring their incredible diversity of experience from several segments of the industry. Um, so joining us today in alphabetic order is Davida Davison. She is the executive director of Food Lab Detroit in Michigan and works to cultivate, connect, and catalyze a supportive community of food entrepreneurs with the goal of creating a new food economy that acknowledges the importance of food justice, uh, community representation, local ownership, and sustainability. We have Jonathan Gaffard, Director of Restaurants, Bars and Restaurants, Thompson, Dallas, out of Dallas, Texas, a newly opened full service luxury hotel in Dallas that is part of the Hyatt Hotels portfolio. And we have Irene Lee, class of 2015, uh, chef owner of May May Boston. She opened May May in Boston in 2013 and has spent the year since driving the industry towards ethical sourcing and fair and transparent employment practices. During the pandemic, she co-founded Project Restore Us, whose mission is to serve working immigrant families by raising funds and paying restaurants to package and deliver culturally relevant grocery staples to the uh, to the working the serve working immigrant families by raising funds and paying restaurants oh, to the neighborhoods hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, Irene also serves as the program manager for Commonwealth Kitchen's Restaurant Resiliency Initiative. Thank you all for being here today. Sorry for butchering your introduction, Irene, just now. Um, but I know this is a topic and a conversation that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and I really don't want to waste time uh, on, you know, the kind of intro. I really just want to get into the meat of it. So let's get started. So, you know, I think it's clear that in, in that no event in recent memory has been such has had such a profound effect on the restaurant industry as coronavirus. Global estimates put millions of industry workers out of jobs and operations have been forced to close or at least their dining rooms or doors um, and may, many may never reopen again. Now that we understand where we're coming from, perhaps each of you could share a little bit about how the last year has impacted your world and your worldview about, you know, the F&B industry. Um, you know, what was your life before the pandemic and how have you changed? So, Irene, I'll start with you. Thanks so much, Lily. Um, I'm so happy to be here with everyone. Uh, about this time last year, I was hosting a public event where we were sharing May May Restaurant's 2019 profit and loss statement with the public, because uh, we wanted to start a conversation about what really goes on in this industry um, and how hard it is to pay great wages and make a decent living. Um, we had a lot of people come in person and we also streamed it on this like weird app called Zoom that no one had ever heard of. Um, and of course, just weeks later, um, everything went to hell. So May May was um, heading towards opening two new restaurants in 2020. 2020 and 2021. And then when the pandemic hit, everything ground to a halt. Um, both my parents are doctors, so we closed right away and basically said, I don't trust Governor Charlie Baker to decide what's safe, and so we're going to close right now. And then in the months after that, we engaged in a bunch of different projects around emergency feeding, providing um, groceries and meals to hospital workers, um, first responders, um, to frontline workers, and a lot of undocumented folks too. In the months since then, we have decided that May May is likely not going to reopen as a restaurant at all. We are becoming a packaged dumpling company, um, and we are really excited to hopefully explore kind of a new side of the food and beverage world through CPG. And then in the meantime, um, I also got myself another job uh, because I have been really privileged to serve on the board at Commonwealth Kitchen for about four years. Commonwealth Kitchen is Boston's um, first and only uh, food business incubator with a big focus on building racial equity in our local food system. And over the past year, they turned their focus to restaurants because many of their entrepreneurs were just not able to operate at all. And it was so clear that restaurants were really gonna need help. And so a bunch of their initiatives about paying restaurants to do emergency feeding eventually morphed into this restaurant resiliency program. So I work with a group of eight restaurant owners who are all black and or Latinx, and we are trying to 
Number one, um, help them get a handle on things so that they can really thrive when COVID is over. Number two, engage, um, empower them to really engage in their finances, um, to look at the P&L all the time and not just, you know, when it's tax season and like you don't even want to see what's on there. Um, and number three, to really create jobs um, that are fair and equitable. And they are such an incredible group. Um, it really is my dream job. So I'll stop there for now, but I'm really glad to be here with everyone. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to share a little bit about what's going on over the last year for you? I know that you just opened the hotel. <laughs> sure. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I, um, gosh, the last year has been so interesting, kind of similar. About six days ago this time last year, we were shutting down indoor dining. I was working for Hillstone Restaurant Group at the time, kind of overseeing the Dallas market and literally from Sunday night to a Monday morning, flipped all those restaurants into takeout only businesses, which is quite the challenge, you know, going from 99% dine-in to 100% takeout, um, and really kind of working through, okay, what does that mean for staffing? How many people do we keep on? How How is this going to go? What, what is it like putting every single thing in a box, and lay it in a bag, running it to the parking lot? Um, so really fl flipping the business overnight, and then we went through reopening um, in May. You know, Texas has been a little bit more progressive on COVID, and so dining rooms reopened for indoor, indoor dining in May, but what did that mean? at 25% capacity, spacing tables out, keeping guests safe, keeping the staff safe. Um, you know, but part of the conversation was how do we pay people in a model where all of a sudden we're relying on only takeout, right? So that was a big part of the conversation. Sometime over the summer, I got kind of tapped for this opportunity to help open this beautiful, almost half a billion dollar building, um, which is pretty wild in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I came on as director of restaurants, bars and events. and. I started in August, we opened in November, and you know, the challenges were interesting. I mean, so many people left the industry altogether. We went, for, went to work places like Amazon and like, you know, and um, a lot of people from management all the way down to busters, food runners, everything in between just were harder and harder to find. Um, but also the supply chain became really difficult too, just even getting the product that we needed from plates, forks, knives, spoons, glassware, like uniforms and things getting stuck in customs that were made overseas and kind of all the challenges that came with that. But we did get this place open successfully in November. Um, and it's been a while to just try to figure out because the beauty of a hotel, but the challenge of a hotel is people are coming from all over the place instead of just your local people. So you have to really also manage, maybe Texas is more, COVID um, relaxed, we'll call it, I guess is the best term, but most places that people may be flying in or driving in from, from out of state or out of Dallas are not necessarily with that same opinion. So it's been really interesting to just kind of continuously be forced to pivot um, with keeping like health and safety at the forefront. And, and, you know, we always think about health and safety in restaurants prior to COVID as just from like the food safety perspective, making sure that you are, you know, following right time as temperature controls and your walk-ins at the right temperature and you're heating things to the right. Now it's masks and gloves and sanitizing your tables and what kind of peroxide cleanser you're using instead of clot, right? Like all of these things that all of a sudden literally overnight change, but you can get your hands on some of the product too. So um, I'll stop there as well, but yeah, definitely just really... Um, an interesting year of being forced to pivot, making sure that people's livelihood is protected. And of course, I will bring up the pink elephant in the room of trying to get people to work when maybe unemployment was a better deal, right? And so that was also just another thing that's kind of unfortunate that unemployment is a better deal than working. I don't think a lot of people want to be at home, but if your health and safety is on the line and you can be okay, then that's another thing that maybe we'll talk about today is just why that was so easy to replace the wages of so many hourly employees to make that a choice they could make, right? Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, but it's a pleasure to be involved and I'm really excited about this next hour's conversation. Thank you. And Davida, last but definitely not least, <laughs> would you share with us a little bit about what your last year has been like and, and where you're coming to us from in terms of how uh, coronavirus and COVID has kind of impacted your view on the industry and things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you so much, um, Lily, for reaching out and inviting me to be in conversation with both Jonathan and um, and Irene, who I just absolutely um, love and adore. And we have been in conversation um, throughout the pandemic. So it's so great um, to circle back um, and hear of the amazing things that Irene is doing. And so, Lily, when you introduced, um, introduced me, graciously, thank you, you mentioned um, food labs, what I would call our theory of change. 
which is wrapped around those three C's that you mentioned. And so if I had to give people an idea of where we were a year ago and to give them kind of an overview of what we did throughout this that year and where we are now, I would say that we moved from the three C's, which is what we're rooted in, but we focused on what the three R's are, right? And so Food Lab is a nonprofit organization that quite frankly invests in culinary leaders, culinary leaders who want to create, grow, scale businesses where they want to experiment with what I would call a radical business model. So we're an incubator and accelerator that supports entrepreneurs and small business owners who have locally owned businesses, but the lab and food lab is all about experimentation. And that's because they want to be in community with other small business owners, chefs, bakers, restaurateurs, cooks, who believe that we can trans the, uh, the food ecosystem and by God use business as a tool in order to do that. And so the three C's really have to do with cultivating, connecting and catalyzing. Cultivating means how do you cultivate a community of leaders, of restaurateurs, small business owners? How do you cultivate that community? You provide business education, technical assistance, you provide support. But the connection piece is so important because we cannot create and transform this industry alone. It's too big. It's too monotonous. It's too is 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 hundreds and hundreds of years of decade and rooted in inequality. And think that you can undo that by yourself is foolish thinking. And so the C in connection is about how do we connect people? And here's the deal: how do we connect people to what we call unlikely bedfellows, people who you would have never would have come in contact with if it had not been for your involvement with your proximity to the Food Lab community. So that connection piece, finding that peer-to-peer -peer support. And then the last one is that once we've cultivated this community, provided them with the resources, the technical assistance, the support, and we connected them to peers, how do we catalyze change? So essentially, how do we go from the I to the we, the we being the industry? And how we transformed is that we had to take our, our those three C's and really start to focus during the pandemic around what we call the three R's, right? This time last year, we were kicking off our fellowship Yay. where we bring in about 10 fellows um, every year within the food lab and we surround them with deep learning, provide them with support and also provide them with some access to capital as well to grow and scale their businesses to create these radical business models that we're talking about. But when the pandemic hit, we had to move from the three C's to the three R's. The first R being rapid response. This time last year, Rapid response looks like getting money into the hands of the entrepreneurs who needed it the most. Probably around this time last year, we were all introduced to three more P's, which was the PPP program, right? In the food lab world, we think about PPs at the intersection of people, planet, and profit, right? That the three P's is what we call the triple bottom line. But the world was being introduced to PPP the payroll protection program. And what we were also being introduced to was the fact that, that a large portion of that money was being taken by large corporations. Cheesecake Factory, $50 million. Lone Star Texas Steakhouse. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely ridiculous that the fact that we introduced a program that really was not well suited for independently owned restaurateurs at all. And it was executed poorly. Were those who really needed the money did not have access to it. And so during this time, we were doing everything we could to support entrepreneurs in the Food Lab Detroit community and the Food Lab Chicago community so they could get access to the dollars that were available to them in the PPP program. This time last year, Lily, Jonathan, and Irene, we were trying to introduce our entrepreneurs to bankers. Many of them did not have relationships with their banking partners. And so they didn't even, some of them didn't even have their paperwork together yeah. so they could even qualify and apply for PPP. So we were trying to get, we were trying to get all of their finances in order so they could even apply. 
But the good news is, is through the hard work and dedication of not only myself and my team, we were able to get almost $2 million in the hands of black and brown entrepreneurs to the PPP program and the IDLE program. And so that was the rapid response. How do we get money into those entrepreneurs, right? The second R was really about recovery. Now that you have, we've been able to rapidly respond, how do we help them recover? And a great part of that, a big part of the recovery looks like, how do we help our entrepreneurs get access to the marketplace in a very different kind of way? In a different kind of way of, you can't depend on walking anymore. You can't depend on foot traffic anymore. How, what is your digital, what is your digital and technology strategy look like? Many of these entrepreneurs don't have websites, online ordering. What are you talking about? Look, toast, you know, it, it, it was a clover. Like, it was unheard of. So we had to immediately help people to get online so they could begin to set up the infrastructure where they could connect to consumers and begin to, to buy and sell, of course, in the marketplace. And then last but not least, and I'll just end it here, the third R is really about resiliency. It, the thing is, is that how do we survive in this industry? And the resiliency for us about was about lifting our voices, organizing, and, and, and demanding, demanding that government step up to the plate. You demanded that we close our dining rooms, then damn it, we need help. We need support. So that resiliency part has to do with advocacy. And that meant how do we organize across the country, create something that's called the Restaurant Act, or create and begin to lobby our senators, our congressmen, people in government, to say that the restaurant industry, independently owned restaurant industries, we need help and we need it now. And here's what we need. And so I'll just leave it right there. Um, and again, looking forward to engaging in further conversation. Absolutely, yeah, I think that that's great. What it seems to be a common thread of like, you know, we've all had to pivot really significantly to accommodate and make sure that our operations can be vital and successful, not only for ourselves, but for the people that are dependent on us, um, but also to find a way that is responsible for our staff, responsible for the people that are, are leaning on us for support and, and identifying some of the struggles within the system of the F&B industry, right? As Jonathan and Davida and, and Irene have all touched on, it's this idea of how do you provide a living wage? How do you provide enough support financially um, for the small businesses that are struggling? Um, you know, I think a topic that's near to my heart in particular was last year, Chinese restaurants were the first hit because of the, the uh, association with uh, coronavirus in China and Chinatowns were hit very hard. And a lot of those small independent restaurants in Chinatowns were not necessarily able to access the PPP loans because they just don't have those kinds of relationship with their bankers or uh, understand the ability to fill out all the paperwork that required it. So it's absolutely something that's that's I think near and dear to all of our hearts. So I mean I think we've identified some of the problems that have long plagued the F&B industry. You know uh, the wages, the 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 mouth hand to mouth, you know um, problems that exist. Um, and some of them we also have significant labor shortages, right? And and there's not enough opportunity. So and there's a toxic work culture. So other what are the what are the other ongoing issues that you all identify that we can we can address or that we can look at and and kind of start to really attack as we start to rebuild the industry uh jonathan would you like to go first sure i mean i think you know there's just speaking of toxic culture i think just um i think we need to make it more appealing to work here but so many people glorify working these absurdly long hour weeks right and you're not you're not doing it right you're not doing it well if you're not you know, doing it seven days a week, 17, 20 hours a day. And, you know, it's almost like this badge of honor that if you don't do it that way, then you must not be successful at it. Um, and I think that's really damaging and dangerous because it, even if there was a more livable wage that existed across the industry, what does that mean for your quality of life and, you know, what you can offer to have a family? Or even if you just want to be single and sit at home on your couch and watch Netflix, like you should be able to do that without, you know, having to make an excuse. So I think that's, for me, that's a really big one. I think too, um, you know, from a from the perspective of, you know, um, and how we treat people who are, you know, immigrants and, you know, the jobs that everyone says, you know, that people are taking away from them. And that's obviously a deeper conversation, but I, I, there's just so many people who are supporting the efforts of these restaurants that are um, essential to our business, right? Who we make it harder and harder for those people to get these jobs. And they're working two jobs, you know, every day. They're working the morning shift, they're working the night shift. And 
to me, that's just also, it's become the norm. It's become like just what you do. And I, I have trouble accepting that that's okay. Um, you know, because, and then the last thing I'll say too, is I think societally, you know, there needs to not be a stigma against having to take care of your friends, right? Like at, the, at, its, at its core, hospitality is just that, right? Like to me, I think of it as throwing a party every day, but I can't tell you the number of people that get uncomfortable when they recognize someone that they know come in because in their brain, they feel like that person's going to think they're less than them because they are waiting on them. They are making their drinks. They are cooking their food. And that's really kind of sad, right? Because the beauty of hospitality is you're welcoming someone into your home. You spend so much time at work, right? And arguably maybe more than you spend in your home. So shouldn't that be a place of pride? But I think it's become a place of embarrassment in certain, certain situations because that's a paying guest. And so they're the customer, they're always right, which is a whole other conversation I think we could have, which I don't agree with. The customer is not always right, but that's a separate issue for maybe for another day. Um, but just that too, like inserting pride, like instead of being having any shame, instead puffing your chest up and getting excited about the fact that someone's going to come experience what it is that you do. Um, instead of glorifying these other careers, like, you know, doctors and lawyers, all those things are important, but so is food. I mean, people come around food for so much, right? They come around it to celebrate. They come around it to mourn. They come around it because you need nourishment. Like there's just so many reasons why robots can never really replace restaurants, right? Because you need that connection. So how can we make it a place where there's more pride across society, right? To be a part of. I think that that's such a good point. You know, there is, there does seem to be, and I know that Davida and I have talked about this, there seems to be almost a stigma of working in the hospitality industry or working in food that, that doesn't seem fair um, for given what we do for the community and how important restaurants and small restaurateurs and, and cooks and servers and, and all of these are as part of the community fabric that we have, um, as well as the, the immigration issue and, and the, the status of many employees, you know, and, and all of those struggles around that and that conversation. And Davida, do, 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 you, do you have any ideas about the, what other issues that we might be facing as an ethnic industry that should be worth addressing at this point? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try to weave um, in and out <laughs> issues because there are so many issues right, right. Um, yeah. that, um, we are facing. So, uh, you know, um, throughout this whole um, conversation, you know, I know we'll be weaving out issues and problems, but more importantly, you know, our feedback around solutions, what's working, what's not working. Um, but I'll be very quick and direct. Um, uh, I think that right now um, it is it is irresponsible. It is atrocious, um, and it is it is violent, um, really. And it, and it border. And I'm going to be very careful uh, the way that I say this. But to open up states where some governors are irresponsible in opening up states, allowing tourists to just ravage your states and your communities. And to open up restaurants at 100% and not prioritize restaurant workers in terms of ensuring they're safe and healthy, help and health and ensuring that they have priority access to the vaccine is irresponsible. And so, and so that is a true issue. The fact that um, uh, there was, there was a, and, and I'm going, and I know that I may be kind of uh, conflating the two, but it's so important there was a, a, a there was a protest um, in New York, I do believe it was, after we heard the devastating news about the um, eight individuals being murdered um, in Atlanta and six of them being Asian American women. There was a protest in um, in New York, and an Asian American woman had a sign that says, "I wish you all loved us as much as you love our culture," right? Um, in the African-American community, we have a saying that everybody wants to be black until it's time to be black. And, and, and what I mean by that is that you proclaim that you love restaurants so much, you can't wait to get back into restaurants. But what you're really saying is you can't wait to be served, right? You can't really wait to exert your privilege and your authority over someone else. Because if you loved restaurants and the people who work in restaurants, the way that you proclaim to, 
Two things. Number one, governors will make sure and do everything in their power to ensure that restaurant workers are being vaccinated in a priority position so that they are cared for. And the second thing is consumers will put a piece of damn cloth over their face, abide by social distancing rules, wear masks without giving servers and restaurant workers such a hard time. It is absolutely ridiculous that we have turned wearing a mask into a partisan issue. The mask is to keep not only yourself safe, but to keep the people who are there putting their bodies on the line to serve you, to keep them safe and their families safe as well. So I'll, I'll just leave it right there um, because the thing that needs to be course corrected is that we need to be thinking about the safety and the health of restaurant workers pre and post the coronavirus pandemic. I think that's incredibly Ooh. well said. It comes down to all of that. Irene, please continue. I, I, I could not agree more with that. I think um, for me, feeling like the lives of my staff just didn't matter to other people, um, to our government, uh, federally and locally, um, to certain guests who feel that they are entitled to come in um, and eat dumplings uh, on whatever terms they want, whenever they want, um, is really painful. And I know that there are a lot of restaurant owners like me who have been in the difficult position of choosing between safety and um, and financial survival. And so, you know, I'll say that I, I, I can't judge the decisions that any other restaurant owner has made. My decisions were about feeling that I would rather lose my business than think that I had maybe killed an employee, um, to be very, very direct about it. I think that when I take a bigger step back, the problem that I see is that we just don't value food enough in our culture. Um, when you look at how much Americans spend on food uh, by percentage of income, relative to other comparable countries and societies in the world, we are cheapskates. Um, what we spend on food at home plus restaurants is less than what most countries that are similar to the US spend just for food at home. And so, and I'm including a, a link that maybe Nicholas can send out. Um, but I think that, that is, that's the problem that underlies everything. Um, we undervalue food and so we undervalue the people who make it. We undervalue the people who grow it. And I think that all of that has to tie back to slavery, right? Because we have had artificially low prices uh, for agricultural products in this country since our inception. And so that continues with federal farm subsidies. And I think it continues with the fact that guests will still go to a restaurant and look at the plate of food and say, I could have gone to the grocery store and paid $3 instead of 15 and had the same thing. That is such a lack of understanding of what that $15 is all about. And so they're not thinking about the person who made the food. They're not thinking about their health insurance. They're not thinking about the other expenses that restaurant owners have to deal with. I always say they're not thinking about the toilet paper because when you go to a restaurant bathroom, you expect there to be toilet paper. It's part of the social contract. And guess what? The toilet paper is free because we don't charge you based on how much you use. You could probably walk out with a roll in your purse if you wanted to, right? But that's an overhead expense and it's one that restaurants provide and you don't think about it when you're looking just at the food on your plate and you say, this is so expensive. This is so overpriced. I hate the word overpriced because it implies that you know how something should be priced and most consumers don't. A lot of food is expensive because it should be, because it took you know human hands and human labor to produce. And so when we undervalue food, that just cuts you know the rest of the value proposition out of the equation. And I think that you know if we could solve that, I think that would address a lot of the issues we're talking about. Um, that is obviously a, a huge underlying cultural problem and, and not one that I think we're going to solve easily. But I do think it's important to, to think about how it all ties back to just what food means or doesn't mean to us here. I think, yeah, I think that at the core of what all three of you have said is there seems to be a lack of dignity afforded those who work in and around food. Um, either, you know, as Jonathan said, that, you know, sometimes staff members are embarrassed to serve their friends as opposed to having a point of pride around it, right? And as Irene said, you know, and 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 having that kind of pride in the in, in culture of it, but also as Davida mentioned, this idea of, you know, 
we need to respect restaurant workers um, and, and give them the kind of opportunities and, and give them the, the dignity that they deserve to lead safe lives with livable wages, right? And do the jobs that everybody really wants to have, you know, to, to, to get the experience, but not necessarily pay for. So when we talk about that, you know, what are, it's obviously an issue of equity, either social, socioeconomic, race, you know, what, this is an obvious systemic issue that has obvious, it has been at the forefront of the social conversation in the last year for sure. And I know for many more years before that, but it's really become a, a, a kind of a lightning rod in our, in our industry. So knowing what's happened over the last year in America, how do we take those lessons in and, and also create change or start to create change in the F&B industry as it relates to our world, right? We can't change everything but we can darn well start today within our industry. So what could me as an operator, as a manager, as an owner do to start addressing some of the cultural issues within my own operation? Um, Irene, do you want to start? I think for me, it goes back to understanding what things cost. Um, and at Maymay, um, when we did have our restaurant kind of operating normally, we implemented open book management, which is essentially um, we taught everyone in the company, um, dishwashers all the way up, how to think about restaurant finance. And then we actually showed them the numbers um, every four weeks. And so one of the things we did as an activity um, was we put little um, stickers on all of the different ingredients and supplies in the restaurant. And so we wanted everyone to know, you know, oh, if you if you drop a whole sleeve of paper towels on the floor, that was two dollars and 50 cents or whatever it is. I think that the more educated we can be about what things cost, that's a huge step in the right direction. I think even, you know, we're talking about the, the well-being and, and rights of employees, but even employees in our industry don't know how the whole machine works. And so how on earth are we supposed to make any progress? Um, and, you know, open book folks uh, who are mostly uh, Midwestern, um, they love their sports metaphors, but what they say is like, how is your team gonna win if they don't know how the game is played and they can't even read the scoreboard? You're just running around on the field. Um, and as someone who, you know, took that approach to soccer as a child, I know that it's not very effective. So. I think for me, just making sure that we're not forgetting that money is a factor. I think, I don't know, I think some business owners want to say, like, I'm not in it for the money, and therefore I don't think about money. But money is actually what makes you able to afford to live your values through the way you run your business. Um, and so I don't want us to shy away from that conversation. I want us to be leaning into it and involving as many people as we can in it. I, so I have a follow-up question from someone in the audience. They said, can you go further into the decision to stop operating uh, Meme as a restaurant? Do you feel that you can have a greater social impact kind of building on what you just said as a CPG company? That's a great question. Our decision was, I would say, largely um, personal to me and also individual to our restaurant's financial situation, which has to do with where our debt was, where our lease was. But I will say there was a big part of me that really um, felt like I, I can't do this again and I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, I wanted to build Maymay so that I would have a platform to do the work that I am really passionate about, which is supporting other restaurant owners, especially those who have been historically under-resourced. And in COVID, I found an opportunity to do that that did not have to do with opening more restaurants of my own, which seemed like a win-win. Um, so I would say it's very specific to our individual situation, but at the same time, I think that I'm getting to sort of live my dream of the future of Meme in a different way right now. You're uh, like coming, like kind of like mama bird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel really lucky. You know, I, I think in conversations like these, I always want to let people know that Maymay has been successful in large part because I have had access to resources um, and I had, you know, I got a great education at Cornell. Um, my family, you know, provided everything that I needed and um, the choices that I have made in my career that people would consider like brave or bold or whatever, like if I were in a different position, those choices would have just been stupid. And I don't want people to mistake, you know, the kind of classic uh, entrepreneur, like don't mistake their trust fund for a sense of courage. 
it does the same thing, but it's not the same thing, right? And so I feel like a huge part of this for me is the opportunity to pay it forward um, because I got to make a lot of really silly mistakes um, and learn certain things the hard way. And I don't want other people to have to do that. Yeah, it's very different when you have um, a, a parachute or a net um, of, of family support, communal, community support and things like that, absolutely. So talking a little bit about the, the, the culture of things also, Jonathan, I kind of wanted to circle back to what you had said earlier about this idea of having pride in yourself and having pride in the service of it and having that hospitality component of it, right? We're here to serve and being of service to one another is, is really a, a wonderful thing to do. It's a thing of point and pride. So how do we start to shift that culture, particularly in larger organizations like yours? What's being done in larger organizations to try to address that issue? And how can we continue to do that? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it starts with, um, to me, this point, you know, earlier, I just think is so essential. And I think, unfortunately, you know, there are um, some people kind of getting in the way, right? Because I think the... I think it really starts with educating the guests, quite frankly. Um, and I think it goes back to what I said earlier about the customer not always being right. I, I just, whoever said that the first time, I wish I could meet them. Because it, like, it, it just causes this entitlement because I'm giving you money for a service, therefore you're gonna do whatever I want. And it's like, well, it's not really quite that simple. If I'm running an American Bistro and you want fettuccine Alfredo, you've come to the wrong place. But I can't tell you the number of times guests have asked me over the years for things that just like are not at all within the lexicon of what we do. And they're just so upset that they can't have it. And there's just this entitlement from the consumer standpoint. I think is really where we need to start is educating the guests. Like someone needs to write a great, I mean, there was an op-ed in the New York Times. I believe it was last year kind of talking about this exact topic. But that conversation really needs to grow legs. And it really needs to continue. Because by and large, trying to meet those expectations are really where we end up kind of having a benefit over backwards left right and center right is you see and then because there's this connection where i have money you have a product i'm paying you for it so you're going to do whatever i want that's what goes back to Danita and irene's points about that's where people don't understand what the cost of doing it is what it takes to bring into life but also is oppressive in its purest form of how you're treating people just because there's money and a service means that you get to dictate how it goes right like it, it, it's such a damaging thing i mean i always think of it this way you know you're late for a reservation well, if you're late for your flight, the doors are going to close at the airport and that plane's taking off without you. So why isn't that same attachment to needing to be on time and honor your commitment that you made by selecting that time slot not given to restaurants? It's given to flights because the flight has to go. But like, we have a plane to take off too. We have a show to put on. Like, we have to land that plane at a certain time so we can take off again and do... Like, there's just a level of kind of like, submissive nature that exists in the hospitality industry that I think is largely being put on us by the guests. I think there's something to understand the other side of that too. Yes, like I said earlier, people come around food for so many different reasons, which is all the more reason to give it that much more respect and care, right? Like to so many of the great points that have been made, if you really need food, you need it to survive, you need it for nourishment, you use it to celebrate, you use it to mourn a loss, you, you use it to close your business deals. Right, like, I mean, there are just so many ways that people come around food and beverage and enjoying hospitality. We really have to find a way to educate the guests because by and large, a lot of people I know have left the industry or get frustrated or frustrated because they can't express how they want to express what they do, right? Like, you know, it's the age old, oh, that chef won't modify the food the way I want them to. This isn't a choose your own adventure. If the chef wanted to, I mean, like, go to a salad bar, right? Like, if you just want all the ingredients to be out there for you to just select what you want on your plate, you're come, you go go to where that place is. But to, to all the points that have been made, you know, to honor the efforts, the cost, the equity, you know, making sure that people have a seat at the table, but, and then just the whole mask conversation. I won't go back there, but I will for just a second. Like, I, it is just mind boggling to me that, People can't just get over it and do what's best for everyone. I, I just, and especially in these restaurants where, you know, put a mask on to order from your server, right? Like they're risking their lives. Like if you can't tip, I don't know, a good friend of mine, Lisa, she always posts about this. And I think I agree completely. If you can't tip appropriately, don't go out, right? Like this is their livelihood. And so I think, again, I mean, I hate to blame the guests. There's, some, there's a ton we need to do culturally inside the restaurant business by all means. Don't get me wrong. But there's also some super extreme amounts of education and perspective 
that we need to insert for the people that we serve so that we can be more successful to change the culture. Because if we're being treated one way by the people we're welcoming into our space, it's just going to make very toxic how we end up treating each other. I, I think that there's so much truth to that. Um, absolutely. And, you know, so funnily, the, the complete phrase of the customer's always right is the customer's always right in points of taste. So whether or not they want more salt, it is not that the customer's always right in sentence, right? And people often forget the second half of that phrase. Um, and it is an important part that is being left off. So, you know, we're talking about educating the guests. We're talking about having some more pride in ourselves, and that's a bigger cultural conversation. But also, um, you know, so we're talking about education. And there was a question in the chat. How do we, what about greater transparency as to how dishes are made and to help diners become more knowledgeable and appreciative of food? So how would you address that, Jonathan? What do you think is one of the ways to better address and educate consumers on, on that? How do we be more transparent in the pricing and the value? Gosh, I mean, that's a tough one because, you know, I mean, you don't come to lunch to be at, you know, to be lectured, right? So, I mean, it, it, there's a limited amount of time you, first of all, from an efficiency standpoint, there's not going to be time to tell every guest every little thing. I think, you know, um, whether that means you break down the pricing on your menu, right? I mean, that could be something simple. Everyone wants to know a calorie count. How about you want to know how this dish came to light? You know, this percentage of that price goes to our labor. This percentage of our price goes to our operating costs. This goes to our, you know actual food costs per, you know, I mean, I, I think that could be an approach. I mean, everyone's so we're counting calories, but why don't we count the dollars it takes to bring it to life on the table, right? Um, and maybe that visual would provide guests with some perspective on what it really did take to get that tenderloin in, broken down, what the waste was involved with that, then putting it into the several different hands that probably cut it, then has to season it and serve it and then and bring it to your table. I mean, maybe that's it. Um, you know, I, it's so Irene's point earlier, right? I mean, sure, you can go to the supermarket and buy ingredients yourself. You're probably not getting the same quality that you're getting in a restaurant. You're definitely not getting the same expertise, right? So really making clear the same way you have to pass the bar to practice law. I mean, you have to know how to use a knife and use the broiler or the pots. I mean, there's just there's just skills involved in in getting it onto the plate. I think that, you know, where servers and from the service perspective where we can, you know, all always find that opportunity, at least in some small place, is really making sure that you tell the story when you have a little bit of a moment to talk to the guests, whether all of your bread is made in-house or whether, you know, Irene, all the dumplings are made by hand from scratch every single morning. Like, how, weaving those little moments of a service points, it's kind of a humble brag, but I think it can be really powerful. You know, mm -hmm. finding those times in the experience to say, hey, this is you know, oh yeah, the burger's great, ground this morning, the bread was made today, you know, we cut the tomato, you know, whatever it is, I think there's just little cues you can give and hopefully people pay attention. And I think then, you know, and lastly, I think I've, I've had this in the past, people ask me, you know, oh, your prices have gone up. And I say to them, well, hey, you know, you come back once a week for that French dip sandwich, you come back once a week for those dumplings. Why do you think you keep coming back? If you could do it at home, you would, but you can't, so you're not. So kind of illustrating to them in a very friendly but informative way, hey, look, like we are creating this desire for you. And the desire is because we have a skill set and expertise on bringing this to life that you, that's the reason why we're special. And so you pay good money for special things, right? Like most people can, it, it, everyone has their candy, right? You know, you could talk about this in a lot of different categories of things that you buy, uh, but really making people understand the candy of food. Right. People understand like, you know, in clothes or consumer items or a car or a home. Right. But there's candy and food, too. Right. Like there's a reason why you keep desiring those things, I think. So it's just telling that story and really making people aware. So I think a lot of this conversation seems to be about putting respect around food and the value of food and also the labor of food. And so I think that that's a really great segue into understanding and asking Davida is particularly how do we from the beginning, create this respect around food and food makers and producers, right? And I know that you and I have had a long conversation about this and it's a topic that's very important to both of us is how do we create that culture of respect uh, around food and the people who make it from every single level? Um, and, you know, so I, I would love to hear, Davida, what your thoughts are and how do we create that culture of respect around food? How does that start? You know, we talked a lot about education. Where, where do we need to inject that in within the, the community that we create in FMB? Wow, big question. Uh, I, 
And I'm thinking about how I can um, answer that question, Lily, because it's big and it's important. But in answering that question, I want to uh, take us down in uh, a couple of uh, roads or lay at least a couple of seeds for folks to further dig deeper into um, at their leisure. Because that's a, that's, a, that's a huge question. And so I think where I, I want to take us first is when we start talking about respecting the food, respecting the worker, I think we we have to start, in my opinion, with empowering and um, and showing workers from a small business owner perspective that we do value them, that we do honor them. It's interesting because our current president, uh, President Biden, is infamous in saying these words: "Don't show me what you value." Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value, right? And so the question is, if we're talking about valuing labor, to Irene's point, as it relates to being open and transparent with your finances through open book management, show me your labor cost, and we can quickly tell you what you value. And so I'll say that in these in, in this context, mm-hmm. One of the things that we saw miraculously, my gosh, one of the things that we saw very early on in the pandemic, when it was legislated by our government that the restaurants, particularly those who had um, in-room dining closed because uh, the coronavirus, quite frankly, was airborne, um, and that we knew that these places um, could were places where people could you know, get infected with the virus. And so we had to close our dining rooms, rightfully so. But chefs are so innovative. They're so creative. They are in the business, to Jonathan's point, in the business of hospitality and taking care of people. You want to know what they did immediately? The first thing they did was they emptied out their pantries, their walk-ins and their freezers, and they gave food to their staff. They created boxes of food for their staff, Understanding, we don't know how long this is going to last. We cannot let this food ruin. So you guys take this food, feed yourselves and your families. And when I get further information in terms of when we can come back safely, we'll just gear up and start again. The interesting thing about it is I spend a lot of time teaching people how to open up a restaurant. I spend no time teaching people how to close one, right? And so that that's a whole different experience on how you shut down a restaurant for an ungiven amount of time, right? And so the first thing they did was they fed their staff. The second thing they did was they looked out amongst their community and knew that there were vulnerable people out there who were hungry, who had just lost their jobs, who did not have access to food. So chefs overnight turned their kitchens into dining room kitchens to community kitchens and started feeding the most vulnerable amongst these frontline workers. They started feeding uh, 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 police and fire, the elderly, babies who were not in, currently in school, who depend on school to eat. They started feeding the least of these. And so my question, Lily, is when, when, when we have a situation in our country where we have people who are making at or below the minimum wage, minimum wage being $7.25 an hour, below minimum wage or what we call tip wage workers who are only making $2.215, my question is we cannot keep paying people less and less and less and less and then scramble to try to find food for those people when they're hungry. You want to value workers? You want to empower workers? Pay them. Pay workers. That's how we do that. And so the first thing that restaurateurs and small business owners could be trying to figure out right at this particular moment, and many of my friends who are chefs and restaurateurs already do this, many don't, but many already do, is you need to figure out right now how you can make sure that you're paying your staff a living wage, a fair wage. And if that's $15 an hour, that's great. If it's above $15 an hour, that's even better, right? 
But not only does it empower workers, what it does, it also creates fairness in the workplace. And it means that tells, it tells your staff that you value all of your workers. You value your frontline service just as much as you value the cook that's in the back of the house. So you want to create parity between your staff. What does it look like when you're trying to create a cohesive environment, a team, and you got servers working out, walking out the door one night with $250 in their pocket from tips, but then you got your back of the house cook that's making $7.25, $8, $10 an hour. So you want to value people. First of all, that starts with a paycheck. And I think what we're going to see is until we understand the importance of paying restaurant workers a fair and living and equitable wage. The fight for 15 will continue. And what else will continue, and this is widespread, and I know we might have an opportunity to jump into this, but you will see the value of unionization more and more and more and more in our industry. You will see restaurant workers coming together to form unions in order to organize because they're tired. They feel expendable. They feel exploited. They feel unsafe. And so you either get it together in shop now or expect for your workers to form unions and expect for self-organization to ramp up like never before. And so we're seeing that right now across the industry. And so even at the Marriott right now, they've started an initiative amongst their workers. One job should be enough. When you have restaurant workers working multiple jobs. And so I think it starts with, I think it starts with pay. Then I think that there's also, you know, just one other thing that I just want to lift up, um, which is so um, important and is something that Jonathan talked about. And there was a question in terms of how do we educate consumers, right? Some people like to use the word educate. I like to use the word engage. And one of the things that we are going to see, and here's the thing, the coronavirus was an accelerant. It's fast forwarded our industry like never before, particularly in the realm of technology, right? Where we are right now in 2022, right? Or 2021, I don't even know what year we're in. It's <laughs> probably where the industry was going in 2030, particularly as it relates to technology. Pay attention to the big boys. Pay attention to the fast food restaurants. Pay attention to fast casual and how they are adapting technology very quickly. There's one piece of technology that's being adapted, which is really interesting, and that technology is AI, artificial intelligence. There's a link that I put in the chat to share with folks to show folks how artificial intelligence is going to change the way we eat and how we work and how we engage with consumers. And a part of educating or engaging consumers is using technology. So there's going to be a point in time when we have adapted technology where people can actually click on a menu item to actually not only find out about the calories that Jonathan talked about, but you can also find out where each ingredient was actually sourced, who grew it, where it came from, how many miles it traveled to get into your plate. There's going to be an engagement between consumers and technology, artificial intelligence, like we've never seen before, because it's happening right now, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, and this is going to be so important as we talk about valuing workers, is the question that I have is, as we begin to automate our workplaces more and more and lean on technology to educate, engage not only our consumers, but also our employees, is what is the value of your humanity in an automated industry? Mm -hmm. How are we going to value you being a human? And what can you deliver as a human being that a robot cannot deliver? Because what I do not want to see is I do not want to see workers being mimicking robotic behavior. Right. That's not it. So the question is, how will beginning, how will we value humanity and hospitality? What does that look like? And what does that look like to provide a service that it is impossible for a robot to replicate? Mm-hmm. You can't get a restaurant, you can't get a robot to make somebody smile and laugh or even cry. And so that's the questions I'm asking myself as we prepare to come out of this pandemic around valuing and empowering workers. So we have a, I mean, and I think this is perfect segue into the question in the chat, which is how do we encourage a new generation to consider entering the F&B industry after COVID? And as you said, to be the, accelerated so many of the issues and, and it kind of exposed so many of the issues of, of, of parity issues and, and, and harassment and, you know, fair wages and all that stuff. 
how, how do we encourage people to get into this industry when there are so many pitfalls and it can be so exploitive? And I think what's clear coming from our conversation is that it needs to start with the industry taking a stand. As we rebuild and reopen our restaurants, we need to take a stand and say, we value our employees. We understand the stress that they've been under. We understand that our guests in many places seem to feel that their comfort about mask wearing is more important than the safe health and health and wellness of the person serving me. And all of in these conversations, right? And this seems to be a big part of it. And educating the consumers that th we're not going to, we still want to be hospitable. We want to share that humanity, as Davida pointed out, but in a way that is fair and equitable and respectful of the staff. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that this is how we need to move forward? Is this the takeaway for today? Yeah. So I, I'm gonna say this really quick because I'm cognizant of the time, but I want I want um, Irene and, and Jonathan to jump in, and that is is I want people listening to my voice and, and others who, who who listen to this because I know it's being recorded. It's so important that we expand our thought process around what the F and B industry is. Working in F and B is not all about being of service and working inside of a restaurant or working at a bar. You understand what I'm saying? We need people behind the scenes. My gosh, I want. I want some of our best and brightest to be working in research and development. What I want people to be working around developing new tastes, right? I want people to understand and be looking at what are some alternative meat sources as well, right? I want people to be looking at, you know, climate and its impact on the food and beverage industry um, as well. We need, we need, we need marketeers to be supporting uh, uh, food and beverage owners as well. We need lawyers, we need accountants. We need creatives, right? We need we food and beverage is so much more than what you see inside of a brick and mortar, right? And then last but not least is I want people to get your feet wet. I think it should be, this is my clarion call for folks, is that I think it should be mandatory that some point in everybody's life, they should work front of house or back of house. Like seriously, you need to get that experience underneath your belt of what it looks like to be put in the trenches to deal with customers. These soft skills that you learn when you work in a food and beverage environment. And then when you get that under your belt, I want you to run for office. We need more people who work around, who actually care about people, who want to deliver that hosp hospitality in a restaurant environment to also be leaders on the front line of government. Mm -hmm. Because if you care mm -hmm. about people when sometimes they can even be their worst in a food or a beverage establishment, and you care about your staff, think about the changes and difference you can make if you are actually an elected official on the local, regional, or even on the federal level. So I'll just leave it. Jonathan, do you, do you, do you think that this it starts with us? Do we have to continue the fight internally so that we treat workers right in order to kind of encourage people back into the industry? Um, you know, I do. Um, you know, one of the things we do here is, I mean, it's it's still a mid-step, but we pay, instead of being 213 an hour like Texas minimum wages, we pay 550. Um, again, it's not 15, but it's a step in the right direction. I think it's also really important to really do the work and figure out who is actually being fair and equitable, whether it's the open book system or whatever it is, like Irene mentioned and Vita has mentioned. I think it's really going to be important also lift up and elevate and highlight the people that are doing the work that is important because it will therefore become an industry standard if we, as an industry, start to really prioritize who those people are, what restaurateurs are, you know, treating people well, what restaurateurs are coming to the forefront and saying, hey, I'm willing to spend the money, I'm willing to make the effort to do these things differently to therefore then kind of start to make that the industry standard, right? Like give attention, highlight those folks who are doing that work, um, because I think that that would have a really impactful um, effect as well. Um, and it, it could take partnering with some leaders at some of the bigger corporations, right? Like, yes, yeah, small business is important, but sometimes the example and the standards are set by those who have maybe the loudest bark in the fight, right? And so it's really, really important too to try to balance you know, highlighting these smaller businesses, but also really get more people involved and find out where the passion points are, where people really do agree. Um, and it's not about agreement, it's also about action, right? Like, it's one thing to have the conversation. It's great that we're sitting here and it sounds like there's a fair amount of people on the line watching, which is encouraging, 
what is the action that comes from the conversation is the part that I get super curious about. Are you going to put your money where your mouth is? Are you going to do a little bit of extra research beyond the Yelp review and find out more about that business, how they treat their people, and then support that business, right? right? So I do think it starts with us, but I think it also starts with us telling that story to the folks in our lives, right? The age old adage of, you know, you tell one person when you have a great time, you tell 10 when you have, um, when you have a bad time, right? Now let's, let's make, let's flip that. Let's make sure that we're lifting up those businesses and setting those examples. And Irene, just to wrap it up, cause we only have a minute left. So, you know, as you continue to mentor these small businesses and, and, and whatnot, what, what is, what, what's keeping them in the game? What's the best way for us to encourage people to stay in the industry or come back to the industry? I think what keeps them in the game is their their passion for sharing their stories, um, whether that's a personal story or a cultural story. Um, they want their they want to make an impact on the people around them. I think that what I loved about what Davida said is that we need to expand our idea of who a food service worker or a food worker can be. Um, a lot of the businesses that I work with, you know, when they think about hiring, they often say like, "I just can't find the right person." And I've said that before too. Um, so, you know, uh, far be it from me, but I think we, what is the right person? Do we just mean someone who knows how to do the job or do we mean someone who is passionate, um, who has the same values as the business, someone who could grow from being a dishwasher to a manager. Um, and if we can really expand what that means, I think we will be able to cultivate potential in so many more people. Um, but right now, you know, we do take the kind of machine approach, which is like, if I'm hiring a dishwasher, am I thinking about who they might be one day? Or am I thinking about, do they know where they fit in the machine? Because right. that is the most efficient way, you know, to get things off the ground. And so I think for me, I really, I think about how we just try to imagine more potential all the way around. And I think that is like, that's like the same generosity and hospitality that drives what you see in the front of house in the best restaurants in the world. Um, that desire to see people, to be connected with them. And so we need to make sure we're applying that all across the board, I think. Great. Well, uh, we're a little over and I definitely want to be cognizant of everyone's time. I want to thank you all so much for this conversation today. I think, you know, there's been a lot of interest in it. I can't wait to keep, I wish we could keep having this conversation. I know that I could do it for hours with the three of you for sure. Um, but I want to thank you all for your time and your thoughts and your energies in making the FMB industry a better place for all. Um, I also want to thank the School of Hotel Administration for allowing me to do this and the Center for Hospitality Research and Nicole McWitty um, Davis for her support in making this happen as well as Nicholas. Um, thank you so much for having, uh, giving us the space to have this conversation and I hope that those listening understand that it's 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 on us as well as the consumer to build a better FMB industry for all where we treat people the way that they deserve to be treated, that all of us deserve to be treated. And I hope this conversation is only uh, the spark for many more. So thank you all again for your time. Thank you for participating. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And I'm sure uh, our speakers will be happy to receive comments um, from me as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Thanks, Davida. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan.